Thank you, Joe, for having me as part of this weekend's festival. What a real treat it is to be talking alongside so many extraordinary uh, women. Uh, my name is Olivia McKendrick, and I want to take the opportunity today to tell you a little bit about what I do and why. Looking at the lineup of the other speakers at the festival this weekend, I see that their passions for science, for nature, for ocean, for space, um, date back often to uh, their university days, even, even childhood. My story is a bit different, as I was a corporate lawyer for 24 years, and it was only after a fork in the road some eight years ago that I changed direction. And my partner and I, Chris Rainier and I, founded and now run a non-profit called the Cultural Sanctuaries Foundation, which focuses on protecting culture to protect biodiversity. And I'll tell you more a little uh, more about that uh, uh, shortly. But for now, though, I want to start by talking about starfish. And in my old law firm days, each year we had a big global partner um, offsite and gathered to discuss the state of the firm and strategy and finances and, and all that sort of stuff. And at one of these conferences, sitting in a huge room of lawyers, our then managing partner told us a story about starfish. And he described an old man walking towards the shore and seeing with amazement thousands and thousands of starfish washed up on the shore, on the sand. And little girls stood at the edge of the surf and helped a starfish back into the water. And the old man walked up to her and very kindly said that her mission was impossible, that she was no, there was no way she'd ever save all the dying starfish. And she looked up at him and she gingerly slid another starfish back into the waves and said firmly, no, you're wrong. I can make a difference. I can save this one. To this one, I can make a difference. You know, I can't for the life of me remember why that story was relevant to a bunch of lawyers, but I do remember it coming back to me incredibly vividly a few years ago. Chris and I were in a small village in, in Bhutan called Ruka and music was playing and we were watching some of the community dance in celebration, music all around. And to give you some context, Ruka is this beautiful little village in a stunning valley high in the Himalayas in Bhutan. Um, it sits in the middle of five mountains. So it's almost like a sort of center of a beautiful green flower. And the people that live there are the Olep people um, who are the oldest indigenous community in Bhutan. And with the Royal Family of Bhutan and a group called uh, an NGO called the Tariana Foundation, we'd been working for some years in Ruka because its language was endangered and its culture was endangered. And the local youth, the kids, were increasingly going off to find work in um, the capital of Bhutan, Timpu, and other cities, um, really to, to look for jobs. And most importantly, there were only three speakers of the Ole language, which is the language spoken by the Olep. There are only three speakers left. Two were in their um, early 80s, and one, um, Kenga, was um, at the time we, we first went, there were 64. And our, the, the, young, the young kids in the village just weren't interested in what was sort of considered grandma's language. And our, so our project was focused on helping uh, protect that local culture and local language. And we, the first thing we did, the main thing we did was we commissioned the building of a community cultural center. And that center now doubles as a, a it's a living museum. It's a homestay for tourists when they come to village, COVID permitting, um, to bring welcome income. Um, it's a schoolroom, and the local kids are now all being taught Ole. Um, and along with the center, the other thing we did with a group of local and international scientists was to create a survey of all of the local culture, language, knowledge, biodiversity, medicinal plants, et cetera, et cetera, for the community to enshrine their, their culture in a sort of snapshot of their culture. And with a group of local linguists and the, the last three remaining speakers of Ole, we created the first ever dictionary of the language. It had never been written down before. So here we were listening to this music uh, watching a dance, celebrating the official opening of our community centre. And the Bhutanese Queen Mother um, came and blessed uh, the official ceremony. 
and the community elders all gave speeches and the kids were dancing and music was playing. And I just, I felt such incredible pride and I got rather tearful. Um, and ju just thinking about the fact that the, the OLEP culture would now be protected into the future and tourists would be able to come and learn about this remarkable place and the remarkable community that live there. And the kids in Ruka wouldn't have to go to the cities to find work. They could stay in the valley if they wanted to. And finally, the, the Ole language might now have a chance. And it was at that point, thinking about that, that I just thought about the starfish story. It just came back to me in a, in a flash. And I thought, well, you know, there are cultures eroding all around the world. And there are languages dying at the rate of 24 a year. 24 oral languages die a year, which is just extraordinary. And I just thought, but we had made a difference. We had made a difference to that culture and to that language. So, so rolling back the, the clock a bit, just to explain perhaps more of the context of this all. Um, when I went to the Paris Climate Cop in 2015, I was still a partner at my law firm. I knew little of conservation. I knew less about indigenous communities. And I knew absolutely nothing about the connection uh, between the two. Chris, on the other hand, had spent his life as a photographer and ex National Geographic explorer, really learning about and supporting indigenous cultures all over the world and working with endangered languages all over the world. So he, he understood that indigenous um, uh, sort of depth of indigenous knowledge um, and understood that they that their message that nature was not for consumption and that we had to have to nurture it and love it and look after it rather than just consume. Um, and in a way that we all need to re-indigenize. Um, so at the, this Paris climate conference, we both had a sort of light bulb moment over some escargot and a glass, maybe a bottle of red wine. Um, and just really suddenly just sort of realized that indigenous guardianship, indigenous culture, indigenous knowledge had to be at the forefront of the climate change debate and the climate change fight. And so not long after that, we set up our, our charity foundation, the Cultural Sanctuaries Foundation that we now run. And not long after that, I left my legal career to work full time for the foundation. So what do we do? We work at the crossroads of culture and conservation. We work where both culture and biodiversity are endangered. And of course, the fact is that the two almost always overlap. 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity is on land lived on by indigenous people. And um, I'm not sure everybody knows that. I certainly didn't know that. And science now proves that um, that indigenous, where land is lived on by indigenous people, it will thrive and it's got a better chance than even national park status. So indigenous peoples are proved by science to be the best guardians of um, biodiversity. But indigenous peoples cannot be its guardians if they're forced by economic duress or climate change or wilderness degradation to move from their land, or if they've go, got no choice but to join the illegal or legal miners or loggers for want of any other, or, or other income or other jobs. And they can't be its guardians if their kids leave, um, if their languages die out and the connection with the land is broken. So if we are to protect land and ocean, we have to protect culture and language. And if we're to stop deforestation, we have to find other, we have to help support other jobs for local communities. And if we're going to protect more land and ocean, we need to uh, let the indigenous communities lead the way and let them support their involvement and not let them be di displaced or disadvantaged any further. It's all interconnected. It's all one ecosystem and one economic system too. And sometimes people ask us, you know, what is the solution that indigenous people bring? What is this magic uh, answer to climate change? And of course, there are, there are myriad examples of indigenous solutions um, to biodiversity sustainability. In Guatemala, climate signs are read by indigenous elders, expose roots of corn, foretell hurricanes and storms in the upcoming winter. And the size of particular birds' nests indicate the need to delay or start the planting of crops. 
in Central Europe, traditional herders know exactly how to manage their pastures, the right kind and level of grazing to keep the weeds and, and bushes in, in check and keep the grasslands in, in balance. In Malaysia, indigenous communities operate a system called Tagal, um, which sustainably to sustainably manage uh, their rivers and committees of elected elders decide on no-take areas um, and ban destructive fishing practices so that fish numbers increase, endemic species return, and the, the river system stays healthy. And perhaps a very apt example in Australia, um, the Aboriginal millennium-long practice of intentional burning staves off the risk of these mega forest fires that we've been seeing all around the world, California, um, Europe, uh, and Australia. And after generations of being banned from practicing their traditional fire knowledge, this right way burning is now being recognized by the authorities and is being reintroduced as the right approach to, to combat the forest fire uh, issues. And the list goes on and on and on. But the point is that none of these specific examples represent a sort of silver bullet. There is no sort of indigenous silver bullet to the climate change debate or the biodiversity fight. Um, the key thing is the, the, the understanding of nature, the connection with nature, the respect for nature, the fact that the land goes together. And as Al Gore always says, you know, we can't just keep treating our air as an open sewer. And as Sylvia Earl, who I think is also speaking at this weekend's festival, says we can't just keep take, take, taking from our ocean as if we've got a kind of ATM that only has a withdrawal function. Um, and so we've got to follow this, this, this lead, this indigenous lead, and allow the indigenous peoples to be the guardians that they have been for so many thousands of years. And I think it's, it's funny, people, I think people sometimes wonder what a white former corporate lawyer from Cambridge, England, is doing talking about indigenous communities and working with indigenous communities, promoting indigenous communities. Um, and I don't see any disconnect in that at all. My father is a huge proponent, passionate about women's rights. Um, and you don't have to be a woman to stand up for women's rights. You don't need to be black to bl march for Black Lives Matter. And you don't need to be indigenous to understand the critical importance of indigenous communities, um, both in terms of culture and in terms of um of biodiversity. So and it's up to all of us to, to fix this wherever we're from and whatever we can do. Um, and the other thing that sort of surprises me, has surprised me in relation to all of this in some ways, is how much easier the transition from being a corporate lawyer in London and New York to, to philanthropy and conservation has been much, much easier than I would ever have expected. I mean, if you told me 10 years ago that I would be leaving my law firm, I would not have believed you. I absolutely lived and breathed that job. Uh, people used to say I'd be carried out in a box. Um, but when the time came, actually, it, it, the move was remarkably easy. And if anything, I sort of felt guilty about not being more guilty. Um, and I jumped sort of headfirst into this new direction and this new passion. Um, and... And the two things have been remarkably connected in some ways, because in some ways my legal career really set me up for this new life, this new direction. Um, and many of the skill sets that I learned in, in the time, my decades as a lawyer, seem just as relevant now, not just because in running the foundation there's lots of sort of legal stuff, which there is, um, but because, you know, everything that you do, well, everything we do now in running the Cultural Sanctuaries Foundation and in our projects is preparing budgets, forming partnerships, um, negotiating, building relationships, building strategies, fundraising, making presentations, um, doing pitches. Everything um, was really born of what I learned uh, in my legal career. So it's funny, in a way, how sometimes life's twists and turns take you in new directions, but it sh it's really shown me that it's fine to take a new direction and it's fine to do different things. And I love my legal career, but I now love even more running the foundation and, and doing our projects. And I guess the main lesson for me was has been that doing one thing uh, for a long time doesn't mean that you can't do another. Um, so 
five years in at Cultural Sanctuaries, um, alongside our projects in Bhutan, we've got projects in Mongolia, Mexico, Ecuador, Brazil, and Kenya, uh, to name but a few. We've got other other projects in the in the works. Um, we've got a lot to do, um, and we're in a race against time. But the good news is, the really good news, that at the recent Glasgow Climate Conference uh, just in November, unlike in Paris, um, no one questioned the connection between indigenous culture and conservation. Um, I think that, that, that connection seems now to be really understood and really accepted. Um, and, and the role of indigenous peoples, the role of indigenous guardianship uh, is, is really recognized now, which is fantastic. So we feel our work is even more important. And as the world moves to protect 30 by 30, which is this ambition to protect 30% of oceans and 30% of land by 2030, and as we move to end deforestation, we've got to protect culture and language. Underpinning all of this, we've got to protect culture and language as we go. Uh, we have to protect the protectors. So if anything, at the foundation, our ambitions are growing. And if um, when we started, we sort of envisaged 10 projects and then perhaps 20 projects, we now are thinking of more, of going further. Um, and really, we're looking for collaboration, and we always work in partnerships with both local um, NGOs, obviously, and the communities that we work with, but to form other collaborations, perhaps with people listening to the festival today, perhaps to people involved in the festival, speaking at the festival, so that we can do further, um, go further and do more. And I sometimes think about that old story about you know how easy it is to snap one pencil, but if you put a bunch of pencils together as hard as you can, you cannot break them. Um, and so if we can work together and join forces, we could do even more. We What if we could join, join by joining together, protect all um, endangered cultures and all languages and reforest the planet and clean our oceans and clean our air and help wildlife to, to thrive? And in a way, I, it takes me back to the starfish story. You know, what if we could save all the starfish? Thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. All right, Olivia, thank you so much for uh, that great background information, that great presentation today. It's incredibly important work and makes it all the more exciting to hear that at COP uh, earlier in the year that that relationship, that connection was being more acknowledged. There wasn't mm. doubt behind it or mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you didn't have to push as hard to convince people. We are understanding that now. Yeah, I mean, an extraordinary sea change in five years. I mean, even to the extent that people said to us, don't worry, you don't need to convince us anymore. We know you don't need to, you don't need to shout this from the rooftops. The question is not now what, it's how, or it's not why, it's how. It's how are we going to make sure we protect Indigenous guardians? How are we going to stop deforestation? They're the key thing. And how are we going to pay for it? Yeah. So you talked a little bit about your your transition from being a lawyer uh, into this new career. And I think, uh, you know, the same story can be seen in a lot of the speakers is starting off maybe in one field, but then following their passion and finding it led them somewhere else and, and making a big change. So with any change, I know there's, you know, there might be some feelings of doubt that creep in or a little bit nervous to leave a stable career. So I'm curious what advice you would give to someone who you know, maybe wants to make that change, has a passion, they want to follow it, they want to make some change, what advice would you give them? Well, it's funny you should say that, because I think it was my father who was much more worried about my leaving my stable career than I ever was. Um, I mean, I, as I said to him, you know, I said, you know, it's not irreversible. If this is a mistake, I, it's not the end of the world, but I just want to try this. Let's see if we can do this. And And actually, as I said, I... I really, I lived and breathed my law firm job. I was, I was working 20 hours a day for years. I'm really passionate about the job. I actually quite blinkered about the job. I didn't sort of look out and up very much to other things. Um, and then, but increasingly, and I never, in a way, I never really left my legal job as much as I moved to the cultural sanctuaries work. I, it wasn't, it, it felt like a positive move towards something rather than a negative move away from something, and certainly not for any negative reasons at all. Um, but at the so the key thing I would say is, you know, just give it a go. And I just don't think it's right that we only do one thing, and, and one job can lead on to another, and you can use all the same skills and all of the same. I mean, the one good thing, of course, about being 
a lawyer for 24 years is I had some financial security. I had my own flat. So I could sort of make that leap of faith, perhaps in a way that might be harder for other people. So that financial security, I think, did help. But I think the key thing I would say that just because you've always done something does not mean that that's what you've always got to do. You can take a new direction and see how it goes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, many would echo that when you're doing, when you can turn your passion into a career, uh, when you're loving everything you're doing day in and day out, it's just, it's the way to go. There's, there's no other way to do it. And then it doesn't feel like work. I mean, you know, it's cause it is, it's just, it's just life. And actually the, in a way, the work life balance sort of blurs. If, if you're passionate about what you do, yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't really matter that there need, there doesn't need to be a break. You don't need to stop at five o'clock. And I think the other the other key thing is that I've always loved traveling and I've always loved photography and I've always loved meeting people and understanding and understanding their lives and their their dreams and all of that sort of stuff. Maybe it sounds a bit cliched, but um, and I really feel as much as I absolutely loved my legal career, I would genuinely say that I have learned more and sort of questioned more, thought more in the last eight years than I did in the previous 25. So the the new direction has, I just feel it's like a journey for want of a better word. It's a it's just the next chapter, but it's a chapter in which I'm actually learning more now than I did before. Yeah. And so, you know, you mentioned travel, you have projects in different places around the world. Um, so I'm wondering when you're working with the, the indigenous peoples and they look at, our lifestyle and the way we're living in the developed world. And, and like you said, that ATM machine with only a withdrawal, I wonder how they feel. Is it anger? Is it pity for us that we're so disconnected from the natural world? What, what kind of feeling do you get? I think that's a really tough question. And I'm, I'm always sort of uh, nervous of speaking on behalf of other people in terms of their views. Um, I, I think, I mean, I think it really depends on the community. And I think to some extent they should be, they should be angry and they should, they should care that they should really mind about what sort of Western or modern society has done um, because they've, they've least caused this problem, but yet they're the ones on the front lines of having to cope with it literally on the front lines and, and will be, well, so they should be angry, but I've never felt that anger at all. I mean, I've re I really haven't. And I don't know whether it's because um, they don't know the extent of which the Western societies have caused this problem and the huge disconnect between the emissions levels um, or that they just don't blame us as individuals for what is a sort of societal um, problem. I've never seen any anger or anything like that. Uh, other, than, I think... I think they should pity us, though. I mean, in a way, because we have lost that disconnection. We have lost that connection to the land. And actually, I've really enjoyed, for me, getting that back in a way. You know, when I was sitting in, in my office in London or New York uh, over the years, or I was in my starting up my Mini Cooper, I didn't think for a second where the fuel was coming from. Or when I turned on the tap in my flat, I didn't think for a second about where that water came from or, you know, remember to turn it off when I was brushing my teeth, et cetera. So I think we have lost that disconnect. And I've enjoyed getting back into nature and seeing how healing it is. Um, so again, I've not seen pity or anger, but I suspect it, they, it, it should be there. No, absolutely. And, you know, what you mentioned is them being on the front lines of the change that we are seeing. And, you know, you think of a country like Carabas where, uh, it's disappearing beneath the waves and you'd be hard pressed to find a country that had less of an impact on Absolutely. the climate change that we're experiencing right now. Well, we heard actually, um, we heard, the, I think it was the president of Kiribati um, talk in, in Paris and he was, he was talking about, he was imploring the world's leaders to do something, to do more, to fix this problem. And as you say, you know, absolutely they contributed nothing to the issue um, but for him, he said, you know, to be realistic, his his fight was not now about mitigating mitigation. His challenge was what he called migration with dignity, where the people of Kiribati and those other um, those other islands that are sinking under the waves, where they're going to go, where they're going to go when the when the 
the water levels continue to rise. And once someone in the audience said to him, well, sort of, what are you going to do to keep your culture alive after the people have all had to move somewhere else? And he said, well, there won't be a government. There won't be a country. It will have disappeared. It'll be up to the people to keep their own culture wherever they've moved to. Um, but it's so incredibly moving that you know to realize the impacts that we the world is the the world has created or we've created yeah absolutely and the numbers i mean you know 80 percent of our biodiversity is um you know under the stewardship of mm -hmm. indigenous peoples um and that is startling as well that you know losing the equivalent really of, of 24 libraries mm -hmm. Uh, around the world each year, this knowledge that's irreplaceable about these unique ecosystems. Uh, 24 languages dying a year. I mean, it's utterly shocking. It's just it's so incredibly sad. And what we always say is that, yes, what we do is all about climate change and biodiversity, but at its heart, it's, it's even if you put that to one side, even if you did that, you know, surely we should be looking after these cultures and languages for their own sake. Surely we should care if the language dies out and all of that knowledge that, that goes with it. Um, so it's important to protect these things for its own sake because we don't all want to end up with the world speaking English and dressing the same and eating McDonald's. I mean, just that rich diversity of culture needs to be protected. But the 80% thing, I mean, it's just extraordinary. And it's just some simple maths in some ways. You know, If we can protect that land, if we protect indigenous land, or we support indigenous people protecting that land, then we save the planet because that's where the remaining diversity, biodiversity is. And I, you know, we're optimistic. We, we are definitely glass half full, three quarters full people. Um, and so we, we, it's not all doom and gloom. There is a hell of a lot going on. I mean, the, the energy, the momentum at the Glasgow Climate Conference was extraordinary. And I know that there are, um, some commentators and activists who think it's all blah, blah, blah. And, you know, their role is really important, but there is a lot going on and a real focus. So we're optimistic that we're going to meet the challenge. Yeah, I mean, you have to be optimistic. There's no other way to be. Uh, and it is exciting to hear it being talked about more, more understanding, um, more recognition of Indigenous peoples and the important role that culture plays. Uh, in protecting our biodiversity. And uh, the work that you and Chris uh, are doing is just incredible and so important right now. And I'm excited to see and hope to see more support uh, continuing to come your way. Yeah, absolutely. That's all. I mean, we've got so many exciting projects. We've got communities just sort of ready and raring to go and wanting to do this and wanting to work with us. So our key challenge as it is for most foundations is funding. So that's yeah. our key focus. I want to leave this link up here. I'll pop it up there. We'll also share it uh, throughout the festival as well if you'd like to learn more uh, about the work that's being done and how you can contribute to that work as well. And then we're so excited in May that uh, you're going to join us for the Global Biodiversity Festival yes. as well. And we're going to spend a real chunk of the festival diving deep uh, into Indigenous-led conservation projects around the world. So. We're really excited to have your leadership helping us out with that in May. Fantastic. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Joe. All right, Olivia, it was so great to see you. Thank you so much for sharing with us and the incredible work that you are doing. Uh, but for now, we'll sign off and we can't wait to see you again in May. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Olivia.